Back sports family, it is here. NFL real football week one is here. Third, we have football Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Pretty soon, Mac Action will be around. Rafael Esparza here from Doc Sports. We have my boy, what to my left, to my right. I don't know. I, I guess I could do what I do for driving left, right. It's my boy, Robert Faringo. What's going on, Robert? Another week, we have week two of college football, but I'm excited for it. I can't believe I'm gonna say this. I am a little bit excited for NFL week one. Oh my God. Slow down. Is it a little? Oh, is it a little? Nobody hates the NFL as much as Raphael does. Don't let him fool you. He's going to do a hundred videos over the next six months. He's going to be talking about the NFL every day, but behind the scenes, his true feelings, he absolutely hates the most popular sport in the country. Oh, I'm going to, they're going to hear my rant when we start talking about the Brazil game. So they'll know, they'll know, they'll know my cards will be on the table when we break down that a little bit. Let's get into it. Yeah, I mean, let's. We had some. I myself had a little rough in college football. I mean, it was I had some really bad plays. I had an under the TCU Stanford game, sixty-one. What was I mean? At sixteen and a half. What was the final score? Sixty-one. So that kind of kicked me where the where the sun doesn't shine early. But we'll bounce back. I love this. Hit. I love the card. Hit my first total. You know me. Once you get that first total underneath the belt. It's kind of smooth sailing, so I hit my first college football total. But what you got for college football? What do you want to talk about your week, your first game? Well, the first, I have to I have to laugh though because you're right. College, everyone's so excited. College football came back last week, and then the very first night, the very first game, I felt like I got kicked in the balls with that Minnesota game, that Minnesota North Carolina. Yeah. You know, it was right around the number, so it depend on when you bet it. If you got plus two and a half, minus one and a half plus two, but you know, the big 10 kicker of the year misses a 27 yarder and then misses what, like a 46 yarder that could have won the game. So didn't get my weekend off to the greatest start on that push, but uh, look, it's football season. We got, we got five more months of big and a North Carolina QB goes down. So if you had North Carolina, you're, you're on the other way saying, wow, I lost my QB. <laughs> in, uh, right. Early as soon as he went time. out, I, as soon as he went out of the game, I knew that that was over. Because that's yeah. how it goes. Team loses their quarterback, loses their star player. Guy comes off the bench and plays out of his mind. But you mentioned the Brazil game, so I feel like that's as good a spot as yeah. any to, uh, Perfect. to to get this going. We got Green Bay and Philadelphia. I got to tell you, this is quite the matchup, right? Uh, it seems like everybody's buying Green Bay. Everybody's selling Philadelphia. However, if you've seen the line movement on this game, it opened with Philadelphia minus one and a half. And it's starting to slowly but surely creep up. Raphael, do you think that this one could get to minus three by kickoff? It could. Uh, this one is intriguing. I've been telling people, and I know the books don't want to hear me. I know the bosses probably don't want me to hear this. But there's a, there's a game you just want to sit back and watch and don't play. This one might be it. The players are being told not to leave your apartment because of the crime in Brazil. They told the players not to bring their bling into this country because of the crime on out there. I don't know what the weather is supposed to be like that. One one day they had, they had high humidity. The next day said no humidity. I don't know what to think of this game. And here's my little rant. NFL, what are we doing here? What's next week, next year's game in Baghdad? The week after that, Venezuela? Why are we in Brazil? There's so many other smaller, safer countries around us. I know it's all about the coin. Do they really care about the player safety? No, because if the player safety, they wouldn't be in Brazil or next year, Baghdad or the year after that, Venezuela. Come on, NFL, be smarter with your money. You could have had this game in Mexico, Europe again, Germany, other say Hawaii. Hawaii is nice. The players probably would have loved to play a week one in Hawaii. Do better, NFL. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, that's really the, the, uh, the unknown from the handicapping perspective about this game is the motivation level of of the two teams. It is week one. Everyone is going to be excited and have a little bit of nerves in those first game, Philadelphia, new offensive and defensive coordinator. So they're breaking in some new systems, green Bay. They have the youngest team in the NFL. How are they adapting to all of this travel? So there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainty in this game for some people that may create a high value situation uh, for me. It does not. I am looking at the total in this game, this game. I'm feeling like, even though we have a lot of offensive weaponry there, this game is feeling like an under to me. It's one of the higher totals on the board in week one. For all the reasons that we talk about, do we think that Philadelphia and Green Bay are going to come out and be at their sharpest in this game? 
I do not. I could see it taking the whole first half for them to kind of get into a rhythm offensively. Vic Fangio's defense for Philadelphia, you know he's going to bring a lot of pressure. That could stunt some of what Green Bay wants to do offensively. So I would not be surprised at all if this is one of the sloppier games of the weekend, and I think that that could lead to uh, to an under there. What do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of uh, laundry is going to be in the field in this one. Again, we're in Brazil. We don't know what the, uh, the weather conditions, the field conditions. We don't know all that. So we can see a lot of offsides from the offensive alignment. Uh, I, I think a laundry could be a long list of what we might see there. Yeah, and I agree with you. The under, low shock, one book has 48 and a half. Everyone else has 49. I don't see it going over. I think the betters are going to be what you just said. They were going to see it. Both teams want to establish the run, get a feel for the game. Because there's no other game like no one's ever played. We've been to other countries before. We've never been to Brazil. So we're going to have to get a feeling. I think the players, we need to get a feeling of the atmosphere, the feel, the, the energy of the crowd. It's going to be very interesting. I do believe it's an under game. I think both Thursday and Friday's game will not shock me if they're both unders game. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, shortly. But I'm a little bit shocked at this high total, and we have not seen more line movement on the under. And this game. I think we'll see stagnant. I think we'll see two and a half. I don't see money coming in to move this to three. It wouldn't shock me if we see maybe more twos down the road. And then the books can just move the juice to minus 120 if they want to try to get some favor. I don't think we'll see a three uh, in this game. Yeah, I don't either. I think as soon as that number pops up, like I said, there's been a lot of hype about Green Bay too. The minute you're giving away a field goal, you get to that 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 key number. The sharp money will get a little bit more involved and the public will jump all over it. So yeah, I think two and a half is about as good as we're going to get. So all right, NFL, Thursday Night Football, Friday Night Football, what, what jumped out at you? What number jumped out at you in college football on Saturday? I love this team. Everyone's down and on this team just because they lost their head coach that went to Houston. Michael Preds now in the NFL holding a clipboard. The Tulane, the Tulane Green Weave, they easily beat up Southeastern Louisiana last week, 52 or 53 to nothing. Cool. It's oh, oh, stop the press. Oh, they beat up Southeast Louisiana. Yep. Well, then I thought oh, it was let's talk, let's talk about some of the teams the SEC play. Who did Ole Miss play? Furman. Well, let's talk some uh, SEC plays Alabama A and M. So we can go we can go both ways if you want to mess up with that. I was more excited that they play Southeast Louisiana because they have a three quarterback system. They're still trying to figure out who's going to be the top guy. The rookie who started it. Uh, played really well. The red fresh that the Richard freshman played well. Then the Oregon transfer Tyler Thompson. He was in there for one series. Who's going to be that starter? I know the offensive line want the, the freshman to play. They say he's more active. He controls the, the huddle really well. It's going to be very interesting. And I'm just not sold on Kansas State. Uh, I know they're going to be able to run the ball, but Tulane's been their bread and butter, has been their defense. Everyone wants to talk about their high power offense the last couple of years with Pratt, and they've had some really good stud running backs and, and wide receivers that can run the slant. They always had uh, speed on the wide receivers. I think the Tulane defense is going to be the main reason why they might hang around and give K-State a fight for their life. So I'm looking really, really looking forward to uh, a two lane. It's a, it's an early game. It's a noon Eastern game. So I'm a little bit bummed. That's one of the first games that I want to see Texas. I think they just scored on Michigan just now as we're speaking, and that could be an ugly game right there, but I really excited to watch two lane to see how they play against a big 12 team. Yeah, you have to think that Tulane is not the type of team that gets teams from major conferences to play them on their home turf. So you have to think that this is a game that they've had circled for a while, that they are going to be very up for and excited for, and that they are going to throw their best punch. Uh, I'm kind of with you on Kansas State. I'm not in a hurry. Let's put it this way. I'm not in a hurry to bet against Chris Kleiman, the Kansas State coach, because he has been so phenomenal against the spread there and and he has just gotten his teams to consistently overperform. So I'm not in a rush to bet against him, but I'm not as high on Kansas State as you know as you apparently are not, but a lot of other people are. I know that they were kind of neck and neck with Utah at the top of the Big 12 preseason poll. A lot of expectations for them to maybe win the Big 12, go on to the playoffs. I just don't see that caliber team. They lack some of the depth and experience that they've had the last few years. But again, Kleiman just wins. He, he just wins everywhere he's been. And every year that he's been at Kansas State, he has had them competitive. Uh, you know, you mentioned it. What's going to be very interesting about this matchup, and the number has – Opened at 11, it dropped down to 10. So Kansas State, double-digit road favorite in this in this matchup, is that these two teams are not carbon copies of each other because they run different systems, but they both do the same things well. They both run the ball. Both teams are going to run the ball 45 or 50 times. I think the team that ends up uh, attempting the most passes in this game is going to be the team that loses, basically. Uh, Kansas State averaged seven yards a rush last week. 
Tulane averaged six yards a rush last week. They both scored over over 40 points. So we really do have some kind of mirror, two teams that are mirroring each other a little bit. So I think it's going to be an interesting matchup, and it's definitely one that's that's I'm not going to jump in the middle of with this number still in double digits. Yeah, I mean, K-State ran for 283 yards uh, last week. But like I said, that defense at Tulane, the linebackers are very experienced. The D-line is very experienced with this coach that's the, the new head coach that's there. I think that's going to be the big key. I think stops. Who's going to get those big stops in key moments when maybe they're kicking a field goal and not getting seven points? That's why I like the plus points on this one. I think it's going to be a real closer game. In case they, yeah, they blew out their opponents, but they struggled in the first quarter. They had, they had trouble running the ball. And when they had passing chances, they missed a couple of big, bad, uh, bad passes, especially to the tight ends. I think a defense of Tulane could be interesting. And don't forget, Kansas State's two and seven against the spread against AAC teams the last nine, last nine games. That's a sharp. That's a sharp side. That, like I said, these are two teams that I'm kind of selling my stock on heading into this year. Uh, so I won't be in the middle of it. But I, you know, you're you're kind of turning me around on it. Tulane, as I mentioned, they run the ball on offense. They play a physical style of football that doesn't just carry over to the offensive side. Teams that play football that way, it's usually on both sides of the ball. So I don't think that there's going to be anything that Kansas State does or brings to this game physically that Tulane isn't going to be able to to handle so and the green wave have have one more win than lsu <laughs> that's got to make them very popular down in the bayou right about now so all right let's let's say the big 12 though for the game that jumped out at me it's uh arkansas oklahoma state this is a game that i actually circled back in the summer when the number was around nine and a half ten with the razorbacks going to oklahoma state they're getting a majority of the action, which I wasn't seeing. They're getting around 75% of the action in this game is actually coming in on Arkansas. That number has dropped from, it was 10 this summer, nine and a half around a couple of weeks ago. Now you're seeing seven and a half. And I would not be surprised if this number keeps going down. I'll be surprised if it is over a touchdown uh, by kickoff. But Raphael, what, what, are your th- what are your first thoughts when you looked at that Arkansas-Oklahoma State game? Well, the thing that scares me that I don't think we're going to see that much drastic line movement. The money is coming in on 72%. Tickets, I don't like when I say 70% and all that because we don't know what those ticket dollar averages. Most likely those ticket averages are like $50 averages. So if you get 20 $50 tickets and you get one guy to put six figures on the other side, it's still going to show, ooh, but the tickets written, 10 were written on this team and only one was on that one. Yeah, but that one ticket was for six figures. So it kind of doesn't really make sense. I do believe the line movement is correct. I thought the number was way too high when they posted it in the summer. I think they posted like May, I think 16th or 17th around those uh, days that they posted that number. I thought the number was very high. I think we'll see seven and a half. If I see seven, then I'm going to circle back to this game because uh, that, that could be a key number or a key play for me. I'm excited for this game. Here's another. I hate these new time slots. Another noon game where there's oh. so many good new games. Do they really want people to watch baseball at nighttime now? Is, is that what the case is? I didn't understand the TV lineup last week at all. It's obviously intentional. I think maybe the idea is if you hook somebody at noon, they're going to stick around to watch other games later. Kind of like, kind of like the NFL does, right? Like, like on Sunday in the NFL, you plan your day on, all right, one o'clock, four o'clock games. I'm not doing anything within the six or seven hour block. And you, you build your day around it, right? That is if your wife will, will let you. And if you get your chores done in the morning, maybe they're, they're going for the same thing, uh, in college, so a lot of good, there's a lot of good games early this week that I'm kind of bummed that they didn't separate those two good those uh, those good games. I mean, Fox is one of the one of the, they're driving the bus right now. It yeah. feels like right? like they're the tip of the spear in college football, and they have that big noon spot. And I think they're just trying to get the best bang for their buck. But again, I don't really understand it. I think that the, it's going to be interesting to see what the ratings say a couple months into the season and what their revenue is uh, from shifting this around than what it used to be where. 3.30, you were always guaranteed to have the best games yep. in that 3.30 time slot. And then more than one option at the nighttime game, you know, 7, yep. 8 o'clock. Usually I had a couple night games that you could that you could pick from, but, but we'll see. But, okay, back to Arkansas, Oklahoma State, though. Uh, I was all over Arkansas this summer in this game because it feels like Sam Pittman's last stand, right? Everybody knows that he's one of the coaches on the hot seat. If they don't go to a bowl game or – and if they're not competitive in the in the SEC this year, then Pittman is gone. Um, I kind of like Sam Pittman. He's just tough, hard-nosed, no-nonsense, 
old school kind of guy. I, I kind of like how Arkansas plays. They haven't been able to get over the hump in the SEC these last couple of years, but it's the SEC. You, you know, like somebody has to finish in the bottom four in the in the SEC. So this has just felt like a must win game for Arkansas. So I like them with the points. He, Pittman has been a good underdog coach and Arkansas has kind of shown up in some SEC games that you don't expect them to. I am going to push back a little bit on what you said. And I know you were the professional. You were a sports book director in Las Vegas for over a decade. So you have a, more insight on this. However, for me, the number of tickets written is kind – I don't want to say it's a valuable tool for my handicapping, but it's something that I consider or that I will look at. And to me, that's a little more important than what the money is on the game. Because if I ask 20 people who they like on a game, I don't care if they're all betting $5 a piece. I don't care if they're all betting half a million dollars a piece. If I ask 20 people who they like on a game and 18 of them say the same side, that instantly triggers something in me that like, okay, I'm going to look at, what am I missing on that other side? I'm not just going to go with the, with the crowd here and, and just get into that group thing. You know, what do those other two guys know? What are those two other guys thinking? How is the number moving? So for me, the amount of tickets written on a game um, is, is worth looking at. There's 80% of the action or 85% of the action on one side in this game. I, I don't care what the handle is. That's, that's for the books to, to deal with. I'm at least going to double back and be like, all right, this is lopsided action. Why is it? What am I missing? Is there value betting on the other side? So for me, I was hoping Arkansas was going to kind of at least get this game around 50-50 action or kind of stay under the radar. This would have been one of my bigger plays of the weekend at nine and a half or 10 around where it opened. But now that this number is dropping, it's losing value quickly. I probably still will use Arkansas, but nowhere near at what I was intending to when I circled this game a couple months ago. Yeah, I mean, the, the number was in May. It was a ridiculous number. And, and I knew that number wasn't going to stay uh, like that. The only thing I, I, I will jump back a little bit on uh, tickets written, 90% of those, some of those betters, I should say 90, people know those betters are looking at the numbers next to the teams. Especially last week when the books made a, a, a nice winning. Talk about, let's say, Florida State. They were they were 80% tickets written on their first game. They lost. 72%, I think, uh, yesterday when they, uh, when they won, they lost. Now, some of those betters were thinking, oh, they're going to come out on fire. They lost in Dublin. Uh, I can't believe they're still – they still have a number next to their name. I'm going to bet that. You have to be very cautious uh, when you're uh, looking at that. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, if 80% is okay, I'm going to look into this. I, I will say, yes, let's circle this game and let's go back and look at this game. But sometimes you have to look at the novice betters and say, hey, some of them uh, are just betting their team. Now, we have to look at the favorite teams. Like if you're looking at NFL – if it's the Packers, Saints, Steelers, and stuff like that, they can have awful teams, but their ticket counts are sky high because they are very loyal betters to their teams. That's kind of my point, that's kind of my point though, though, is I want to know where the sheep are going. I want to know yeah. where the squares oh, I know. are going. I, know I want where to you're know saying. where the dumb money is going. I want to know the games that they are lopsided on so that I can so that I can look the other way. That's that, that's exactly what I mean. Like I know that they're not they're not sharp betters. That's what I'm counting on. And I want to know, well, I know the, exactly what you were saying. Yeah, where the where the public is is going. So, all right, let's jump into the NFL, and this is one that's very very interesting, Raphael. The game that you picked out is going to be very very interesting to see which side the public lands on. Why don't you why don't you start us off in the NFL? Yeah, this one's intriguing just because let's face it, the NFC South. It, we can all raise our hands. Said even moderator can raise their hand. This is the worst division in football right now. I don't care what anyone says. The NFC South. It would not shock me if any four of them win a division. I'm even putting Carolina into that because they're a little bit improved. We're all talking about Atlanta. New head coach, new quarterback that's coming off of Achilles. Who they drafted has a lot of lot of sling in that arm and can move and stuff like that. He has got they have Bayou Robinson, they have great tight ends, their defense is improved. Well, they still have to gel in week one. This is week one. This is preseason week four. So a lot of teams who didn't play their starters the whole time. And Pittsburgh comes in under the radar. People say, oh, they have the worst uh, schedule in a the division. Probably, they could finish last. We all know who has a, it's the winning record every time he's been the head coach for Pittsburgh. We all know that. But it would not shock me if Russell Wilson comes out and, uh, and playing okay ball. I'm not going to say good ball. Maybe he'll cook a little bit. But that defense is still good. I'm calling for maybe an upset right here. I would not shock if Pittsburgh gets the plus money win, plus underdog, and you can take the plus points. 
it wouldn't shock me if, if they go to Atlanta and win this game because I need to see if the Atlanta Falcons can, can gel. No one played in the preseason. I think the defense of Pittsburgh is a little bit healthy. I think the running game for Pittsburgh uh, will be a key factor to keeping Cousins and that high-power offense that the Falcons have. If Pittsburgh can run the ball and maybe not get hurt with Watt getting hurt or have any significant injuries, uh, I think Najee Harris can have a big game. This one, it just scares me if, if you're at Atlanta Falcons. Oh, I got division. They should win easily win a division. We got Kirk Cousins. We have this. This one's one of those ones like, oh, my God, I can't believe my team just lost to Ed Holman week one. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on it. And it's funny, like this game is kind of the NFL in a nutshell, right? Like if, if people were listing the, the five or six most interesting games of the weekend, this one might not make the list, but it's a fascinating game. Like there's so many storylines on both teams, the quarterback issues that the Steelers are having. Are they going to have their first losing season in 20 years this year? For the Falcon, it's the it's Penix, it's Cousins, it's the new head coach, it's the sleeper team in the in the NFC. So it's a really fascinating line. And I think whatever the result is, on Monday morning, people are going to wake up, look at the box score and be like, oh yeah, I knew that that was going to happen. And it could go either way, right? Like if Atlanta comes yeah. out, sets a world on fire and wins by two touchdowns and, and Kirk Cousins look good, people are going to be like, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Like Atlanta's going to really good offseason, whatever. <laughs> if it goes the other way and the Steelers win by 10 points and pull another upset, they've been the best underdog bet in the NFL for nearly two decades. And the Steelers pull the upset, people are going to be like, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Like it's the Steelers and the underdogs. The Steelers are 47 and 25 in their last 72 games as an underdog in the NFL. Think about that. Two out of every three times that they're posted as an underdog over the last like 15 years, they've covered the spread. They went six and four against the spread as an underdog last year with several outright wins. They are one of those teams for me. They get the benefit of the doubt until I see otherwise. If I see a, a plus and a number next to the Steelers name, I'm not betting against them. I'm sorry. I've just I, I've seen this story too many times. The Falcons are not one of those teams that get the benefit of the doubt for me. I do think that they are improved. I do think that they have a positive outlook on the season. I love the moves that they made during the preseason to go out and get Judon and Simmons to really bolster that defense. For me, that's the story of the Falcons is how good is that defense going to be? I see a lot of upside there, but I just don't want any part of the Steelers as underdogs i mean again how many times do you have to see it with mike tomlin and how like for how long are people going to doubt this guy only to see him turn around and win a big game drag his team to the playoffs with mitch trubisky and kenny pickett at quarterback for they're like yeah I, I really just don't want to bet against this guy can you imagine if let's say russell wilson has a, a really good year in the steelers make a playoff i'm not saying he's gonna win a super Bowl, but no matter how tomlin does they're not gonna win the super Bowl. Too, too many better teams but the praise that he would get that he made that he got Russell Wilson to maybe cook again and have a positive season, another winning season. That'd be one of the best coaching jobs, I think. And I'm hearing that Russell Wilson has eaten a lot of humble pie coming to the Pittsburgh organization. He got, I think, the way he's been handling I think that's why they named him a co-captain. It's just the way he's handled himself, the way he's handled Justin Fields. I heard they're really close uh, in the locker room and hanging out with, with each other off the field. I think some humble pie maybe can turn i'm not the biggest russell wilson fan but humble pie can maybe turn you around he can maybe have an okay season better than last year's quarterback with kenny pickett that's i mean that's what i'm saying pittsburgh's recipe has not changed for decades they they do not win because they have the best quarterback they win with defense turnovers Run the ball. and running and running the football and being physical that that's it there's no there's no secret to what the steelers are going to do if russell wilson can come in not turn the ball over be a pretty good game manager. And you know what? Every now and again, draw on that veteran savvy to pull out a fourth quarter comeback or make a big throw late. That's that's really all they need. I think the problem with Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh fans is that exactly what you said. I don't think either one of us would be all that shocked. All that shocked if Pittsburgh went nine and eight or 10 and seven and kind of snuck into a wild card. It's just like, oh, Mike Tomlin being Mike Tomlin, Steelers being the Steelers. I think the problem is, is that that's kind of their ceiling now. They're, their well, ceiling yeah. is, is no longer being a Super Bowl contender in the AFC. The ceiling is, can they make the playoffs as a wild card team and then get beat in the first round? Or are they finally going to have that, that losing season? And after five or six years of that, and that's kind of their station right now, I think people are are looking for more. But again, it's still weird to criticize a guy who literally has never had a losing season in his in his career. That's just that's just kind of bizarre to me. 
So, all right. Going on to the next game, game that jumped out at me was Tennessee and Chicago. Okay. Another, it, it's, it's almost a carbon copy of the game that you picked. Uh, a little bit different because of the line movement, which I'll get to in a second. But here we have kind of the same thing, right? Like we have one team that won the offseason, has had a lot of hype. A lot of people are on the Bears bandwagon. They're the hard knocks team. They got the flashy new rookie and all these offensive weapons. They're playing at home. And they're playing against a team that traditionally, I know the Titans have a new head coach, but traditionally are a little bit more physical, grind it out, succeed as an underdog type of team. The Titans are 22 and 13 against the spread in their last 35 games as an underdog of three and a half points or more. And Raphael, here's the reason I picked this game that really jumped out at me. All the hype is on Chicago, right? This number opened at four and a half. Then it came down to three and a half yesterday when I was typing out my notes on this. And now it's popped back up to four. You would think I don't know anybody that's buying the Titans this year. I know a lot of people that are buying into the Bears. You would think that this number would be going only in one direction, and that would be Chicago line getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. It's not. It's going the other way. Is that a red flag, or is that people just week one, weird things happen? There's always a few weird results. Let's let's play the value on the number. What are you seeing looking at that, that spread movement? I think it's week one. I would not shock me if we see a five pop up. I think the public's going to be all over the Bears. Once the weekend comes, Friday, Saturday, it's, it's, they're going to be a big teaser play. I can guarantee them push it up to 11 or uh, what, but plus three. Uh, I, I would not be shocked if they're a big teaser. We we'll, might see four and a half, five. I don't think there's no way we'll see a six on this game because that's the, the books would, would not move that. But a five, we could just because we sweep. They already have action on four and a half, getting more action. For just a half a point, it's not that bad to lay off. Uh, I think the the, the betters would bet the Bears uh, probably over the weekend. I, I, and I kind of like the Bears on this shot. I just, I have no trust in Will Levi's, Levis, anybody puts mayo in their coffee, I have no trust. I mean, I, I'm turned around on this game. Back in June and July, I'm looking at this number, and I'm like, that has backdoor co- – when I was around four and a half, I was like, that game has backdoor cover all over it. Okay, because you talk about how the Steelers have earned my trust and I like with their performance over the last 15 years that if they're an underdog, I'll jump on them. The Bears have not. They do not get the benefit of the doubt. Them being home favorites against an allegedly inferior team. Last year, they were favored over Green Bay in week one. You remember that? Yep. Jordan Love making his, his first real start. Young team. Bears at home. Revenge game. You know, Green Bay has, has beat them in the face for years. Oh, Owned this them. is the Bears getting, getting their payback, right? This is their moment. And they got demolished in the second half of that game. So I'm, I'm still a little skeptical of the Bears just on spec. Uh, I do like what I see. I mean, all the Caleb Williams hype is absolutely justified. Still have to go out and prove it. And here's a stat that I have for you, Okay. Caleb Williams is the 19th quarterback drafted number one overall that will start for his team in week one of the draft. The last number one overall draft pick quarterback that started his first game in week one, that one was David Carr back in 2002. They won 19 to 10 over the Cowboys. And the last Rookie quarterback drafted number one overall to make it through an entire game without throwing an interception in his first start. You got to go all the way back to your boy, Jeff George, back in 1990. I think eight of the last nine number one overall draft picks to start have lost their first start with Kyler Murray tying in his first start as the only guy that that uh, that actually pulled a result. And these draft picks, these number one overall draft picks are three, 14 and one against the spread in that week one game since 1990 so i'm sorry 314 and one straight up five and 13 against the spread so but this is a totally different situation for williams he's uh, name me one quarterback that's been drafted that has this much talent normally if you're the number one pick in a draft your team stinks just like look at tennessee when they had their number one quarterback with levis their team stinks. there's still team still stinks people think they're gonna have the worst record uh in the nfl battling with new england the only thing that's kind of I want to push all those fantastic stats that you just said on that is how much talent the Bears put around Caleb on both sides of the ball. 
offense and defense. I've never seen a rookie quarterback get drafted number one and have this much talent around him his first season. So, yeah, those stats, fantastic. I'm staying away from this game just because of just, just too many variables of question marks floating around in my head. But it would not shock me if I see son of a bitch. The Bears are up by 17 in the fourth quarter, and I and I didn't lay the four, four and a half, or whatever. Just because of that talent, this kid provided, the Bears provided him, is it, just unbelievable. Yeah, I'm I'm with you 100%. I'm a Bears fan, I have to say, but uh, that believe me, that does not Homer. influence my handicap. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly it. So I feel like same thing. This is going to be just like that Falcon-Steelers game. You're going to wake up Monday morning, look at the box score, and be like, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Oh, yep. oh, rookie quarterbacks never win their, their first thing. Oh, I'm not surprised Tennessee won. Or, like you said, the Bears win by double digits. And you're like, oh, yeah, see, all the all the hype was justified. So, all right, we got to get out of here. But before we do, Raphael, there's one more game. Before we get to our free plays that I want to touch on really quickly, another very interesting line movement uh, in these week one games is the Jets at San Francisco in the Monday night football game. Okay, number opened at six. It has been slowly and steadily sinking like a stone. How low do they go in this game? And – you tell me, is this sharp money? Is this public money? Is this San Francisco just hasn't had a really good preseason? Like, like talk to me about this line movement and how you see it playing out in the game. All the above. It's all the headaches that San Francisco has dealt with with Brandon Ayuk saying, yeah, I purposely made it tough for the owners to pay me. And then Trent Williams coming in late, getting his money. This is do or die for San Francisco. If they don't win the ship, there's going to be some head strength. Because now you have the owners who just, hey, you know what? Everyone in that locker room got paid. They're not like the Cowboys who are Dak still waiting and everyone else still waiting. Everyone in that 49ers has gotten paid. Even Bosa got paid a couple years ago. So you can't say the defense is not getting paid. There's some big numbers on that defensive side. This is a lot of pressure for the 49ers. And I understand Jet money coming in because if you're a Jet fan or just looking at the Jets, you're not going to win on Aaron Rodgers. You're going to win on that defense that the Jets have. I think it's going to be a very low-scoring game. Uh, That's why I think the money is going to probably – come in i see it closing around four four and a half i don't think it goes down to three and a half i don't think we see five anymore i think it's going to stick around four four and a half, depending on how also depending on how the public does on sunday if let's say the pun public just crushes the books then you'll see favorite and over favorite and over coming in all on monday night and that maybe move a point maybe move the game to a half a point but as of right now I think we'll probably close around four and a half four but their money's coming in because of that defense not because of aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I loved it at six over the summer. Again, this is another, I one, too. another one of the games that I circled that I was like, this might be the biggest play of my opening week, but you lose the value coming up. But that's, hey, that's that's the way it goes. Sometimes the number moves for you. Sometimes the number moves against you. All right, Raphael, you got a free play to give these people before we get out of here? Yeah, I'm going to Colorado, Nebraska. And last time I checked, it's 2024. It's not 1990, and I still can't trust Nebraska. Sorry, Tony George. Sorry, Scott Spritzer. But I still can't trust him. Granted, I have a lot of great uh, athletes coming in here through the transfer reporter. I love this quarterback that they got. I love the new coaching staff. And I'm not 100% sold on Colorado. We're going to see a lot of points going on this one. But if you're telling me I can get plus points with Nebraska, I don't care. The, the, the girls' volleyball team just got swept by SMU yesterday, one of the biggest volleyball upsets. And we all know Nebraska ladies are crushing it in volleyball. They lost. Maybe we'll see another trend coming. I like Colorado plus the points. I think Nebraska wins by four points or less, but I'm going to take the plus points. I love the offense of Colorado. They can't play defense, but they're going to put some points up on Nebraska. Maybe you you can have Colorado. I want I want nothing to do with them. I just I just think they're trash all the way around. Uh, I'm starting to come around on Shador Sanders a little bit. I, I you know I still don't have him tabbed as like number one overall pick kind of caliber, but there's no doubt that he can play and that. He's just not getting any protection and being. No, being but this plays all fading Nebraska's. I did, it's not 1990 anymore, Nebraska. All right, <laughs> my, uh, my pick, I'm staying, I'm staying in college football, and I'm actually going with Georgia Tech minus three over Syracuse. Um, look, I like both of these teams, the direction that they're headed. Georgia Tech is just a lot further along than Syracuse is right now uh, with, with Brett Key and with his system. They've already gone on the road to Ireland and won a football game. So they're not going to be scared of heading up north and playing in the Dome, uh, which is not nearly the the, the raucous, crazy, difficult-to-win place that it used to be you know, 25 years ago. 
Georgia Tech runs the ball. That's what they do. They do it very effectively, and they can do it on almost any team in the country. Syracuse looked terrible. Their defense looked awful trying to stop the run against Ohio last week. This is also one of those situations early in the year where I think the fact that Georgia Tech has already had two games to kind of work out some of the kinks and build a little bit of momentum works in their favor versus Syracuse, who new head coach, new systems, a lot of new players, new quarterback. They only had that one game last week against Ohio. They're still figuring some things out. So just a lot of things are pointing towards Georgia Tech. Number small, it's only minus three. I can see them winning this by by double digits just by running the ball down down Syracuse Syracuse's throat. So, all right, Raphael, you wanna you wanna take us out of here? Yeah, thanks for joining to another our second episode of What Are the Odds? I am Raphael Esparza. Robert Faringo is right next to me. Have a fantastic weekend. Be safe. Be good humans, and please don't bet what you don't have.